Hello and welcome to Rao's IS. This is the daily news simplified for the date 29 January 2024. And in today's discussion, we have taken these following topics which are displayed over your screen. And the first topic for prelims is regarding Simli Pal Tiger Reserve. Recently, the Chief Minister of Odisha has announced a safari to see the melanistic tigers which are only present in this particular tiger reserve in the country. The second MCQ is regarding acid rain and we know that acid rain is caused primarily caused by anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions. The third topic is regarding end to end encryption and this is an important technology in IT and computers. The fourth topic is regarding the recently RBI has given guidelines on state guarantees. We will see this topic. For the mains perspective, we have taken two important topics and one of which we have taken from Hindu business line. And this is regarding the National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited and which was an important mechanism which the government announced in the year 2021. And basically it was to deal with the growing burden of NPAs in the country, non-performing assets. So we will see in detail about this all issue. The second topic is regarding judicial independence. And this was in news because the Chief Justice of India has recently talked in length about the importance of judicial independence. And for the summary section, we have taken two important articles. First of which is regarding the genomic revolution promises to transform cancer care. As you know that the presence of cancer is increasingly uh, is increasing in the country and globe. And for that sense, there is a there is some genomic sequencing technology based on which we will see this summary. And the second topic is regarding the evolution of central government subsidies in the recent years. So we will be dealing with these topics today. And so before starting our discussion, if you like our video, give us a thumbs up. And if you have any doubts, you can ask us in the comment section. Right. So let's start our today's discussion. So, the first topic for today's discussion, the first MCQ is based on this news article which appeared on the page number 12 of Indian Express in the explained section. And now, in this news article, the context is that the Chief Minister of Odisha has announced a melanistic tiger safari in the Simli Pal Tiger Reserve. So, in this news article, there are two keywords. The first keyword is melanistic tigers. And the second keyword is Simli Pal Tiger Reserve. So first of all, let's see what are melanistic tigers. See, melanism is a genetic condition which is associated with the increased production of melanin, which is a protein which gives black or dark color to the skin, hair, feathers, among others. So if we talk about melanistic tigers, the melanistic tigers are only found in the world in Simli Pal Tiger Reserve, which is present in Odisha. And this is the most important fact. And how are these tigers melanistic? If we talk about their appearance, in this image if you can see, this is a tiger and it looks different than the normal Royal Bengal tiger which we usually see. This is because of the presence of this uh, dark colored black lines in the body of this tiger. So melanistic tiger are distinct from normal tigers due to the presence of dark black lines or dark black pigments in their body. right? And why is this genetic condition? What is the reason for it? This is because of a gene mutation. That is there is a there had been happened a gene mutation in the species of this tiger in Simlipal tiger reserve. And because these tiger, this small population of tiger, if they had been isolated for long and due to which they did inbreeding. Inbreeding is breeding between the associated species, associated family lines. And because of this inbreeding, this genetic mutation, they passed on to the family line. That's why the tigers, they're all progeny, they are, they generally, we see, the increased melanin content in their body and because of which we find melanistic tigers in Simlipal Tiger Reserve. Right? 
so now we have framed based on this information we have framed a question on simlipal tiger reserve and before solving this let's see a few facts about this tiger reserve simlipal tiger reserve is present in the mayurbhanj district of odisha and if we see the map of india this is odisha and here in the northeast of odisha we can see the location of simlipal tiger reserve and wildlife sanctuary right and this is a part this tiger reserve is a part of mayurbhanj elephant reserve and this mayurbhanj elephant reserve this comprises of of three protected areas these areas are simlipal tiger reserve hadagad wildlife sanctuary and kuldiha wildlife sanctuary and these locations are also uh, demonstrated in the map which is given to you and the name simlipal the tiger reserve derives its name from the abundance of red silk cotton trees so there is a tree also known as simul simul is a tree a uh, deciduous tree which is native to india and which is predominantly found in this tiger reserve and this tree it has a fiber which resembles cotton and it has a flowers of red color so that's why this uh, tree is also known as red silk cotton tree because of presence of this fiber resembling cotton right and this tiger reserve in turn derives its name from the simul tree and if we talk about the important fauna which is found in this tiger reserve this fauna is melanistic tigers and which are happened an estimated uh, number of these tigers are around 10 to 16 tigers in this simlipal tiger reserve are melanistic or pseudo melanistic and apart from tiger we can also find there asian elephant god and charasinga or chausinga and this this tiger reserve is an important biosphere reserve and it is a part of unesco world network of biosphere reserve since year 2009 and one important fact about this is that simlipal tiger reserve is the second largest biosphere reserve asia second largest biosphere reserve and it is the only wild habitat for melanistic royal bengal tigers in india and also in the world right so based on this information let us solve this practice question and now this topic is important because upsc generally ask questions regarding the locations of uh, national parks these tiger reserves wildlife sanctuaries and uh, we can see that as in the year 2020 we found this particular question regarding the critical tiger habitat now let's solve this practice question which says that with reference to the simlipal tiger reserve consider the following statements the first statement says it is the country's only wild habitat which hosts melanistic royal bengal tigers and this is a correct statement it forms the part of unesco's world network of biosphere reserve and this is also a correct statement the third statement says simlipal derives its name from the abundance of red silk cotton trees growing in the area and this is also a correct statement so as the question asked how many of the were statements are is or are correct our answer would be option c3 as all three statements are correct with this let's move on to our second mcq for the day which is regarding which is inspired by this news article which appeared on the science section of the hindu and this news article basically talks about acid rain so what is acid rain rain is any form of precipitation in the form of rain in the form of hail snow right acid rain is generally uh, if we talk about the ph of pure water you must be aware uh, regarding ph scale so ph scale is any scale which has numbering from 0 to 14 and uh, it indicates the acidity or alkalinity of any substance say this is the midpoint and this is neutral scale and the 7 the ph scale of 7 refers to neutral and if we move on to the left side of the scale from 7 to 0 the acidity of any substance increases right that is the ph scale of 1 will represent the strongest acid and if we move on from 7 to 14 to the right hand side the alkalinity 
of any substance will increase that is any substance having any chemical having ph of 14 would be most basic or the strongest base so today we are concerned about acetrine right so if we talk about pure water or distilled water the ph of pure water is 7 and if we talk about normal rain the ph of normal rain is not pure 7 it ranges from 5.6 to say less than 7 so this is generally the range of uh, uh, normal rain and this is because normal rain is slightly acidic it is slightly acidic why so this is because of the presence of carbonic acid hco3 and which is how how it is formed when carbon monoxide it reacts with water it forms hco3 which is carbonic acid so in general rain we so we see that generally rain is slightly acidic but if we talk about acid rain this is a kind of rain which is formed when in water the pollutants like nitrous oxides generally no2 nitrogen dioxide or so2 sulfur dioxide when this nitrous oxide and this sulfur uh, sulfur dioxide if they react with water then they form strong acids and these strong acids if we talk about their ph then the ph of acid rain is from 4 to 5 in this scale from 4 to 5 so this is because of the presence of two strong acids which is h2so4 that is sulfuric acid and hno3 which is nitric acid so this is what is acid rain and now how is acid rain caused what causes acid rain the primary reason is the burning of fossil fuels because of burning of fossil fuels we see the emission of sulfur dioxide and also nitrogen oxides emission and also when these fossil fuel they burn at high temperature in the case of say in the case of vehicular exhaust then in that case we see the emission of nitrous oxides so generally these are anthropogenic causes like in gas refineries thermal power plants vehicular exhausts burning of fossil fuel but there are some natural phenomena also during which these so2 and no2 these they release for example volcanic eruptions in volcanic eruptions so2 emissions and nitrogen nitrogen oxide emissions occur in cause in case of lightning in case of lightning we see the emissions of nitrous oxides so apart from anthropogenic causes there are some natural causes also based on which these pollutants they are released in air but the primary cause of acid rain is because of presence of these because of anthropogenic factor and presence of so2 and nox right nitrogen oxides and now based on this information let's solve this practice question which says that with reference to acid rain consider the following statements and if you see in the previous year 2022 we found this question which was regarding acid rain and now it's clear that the components of acid rain are nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide right and now let's see this question the question says statement 1 carbon monoxide is the major contributor in the formation of acid rain no this is an incorrect statement as the major contributors are nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide second statement says acid rain is only produced due to anthropogenic emissions now this is an incorrect statement as we saw that the primary causes anthropogenic emissions but acid rain sometimes it can also be caused due to the emission of these pollutants by natural phenomena like volcanic eruptions and lightning right so as the question asked which of the above statements is or are correct our correct answer would be option d neither one nor two right now with this let's move on to our third mcq for the day and it is inspired by this news article which appeared on the page number 9 of the hindu now this article is about what is end to end encryption now we will understand this in simple terms first of all what is encryption encryption is codification of any message or any information before it is passed on to from a sender to a receiver say a person wants to send a message to a receiver 
and this information can be encoded or it can be made unreadable through encryption by the process of encryption or by converting it into a cryptic form which is not easily readable and this is because to protect the privacy of the contents of information because primarily of this reason to ensure privacy messages are encoded or they are encrypted such that only the sender and receiver only they get to know the contents of the message and other people do not get to know about this content right and now if we talk about encryption generally encryption is of two types the first type of encryption see this is encryption that is a sender and this is a recipient and this message this plain text which the sender sent this has been encrypted and then when the receiver will receive it before he receives it the message will be decrypted right such that this message is in readable form to the recipient and now let's talk about encryption there are two types of encryption the first type is symmetric encryption the first type is symmetric encryption so what happens in symmetric encryption in this type of encryption there is one secret key now let's understand this in this way say there are there is uh, there is a sender alice and there is a receiver bob and she wants to send this message to bob and there is a document she wants to send it to the bob so what can she do she can apply say password protection say that pdf which she is sending to bob is protected by a password right and that particular password is key this particular password which she applied to the document is the key and only when bob knows the key he will be able to decrypt that locked document right so this is just one simple example of symmetric information symmetric encryption so symmetric in encryption means when there is only one key which is involved and this key is common to both the sender as well as receiver so this is the basic uh, this is the basic fact about symmetric encryption now see what are the problems with symmetric encryption the problem is that when alice is sending this message to bob in between there can be a hacker right there may be a cyber criminal or there may be any other third party say internet service provider which can access the contents of this of this document to address this issue there is another type of encryption which is known as which is more secure encryption is encryption uh, symmetric encryption may be secure but to enhance its security there is another type of encryption which is known as asymmetric asymmetric encryption now see what is the difference in asymmetric encryption in this kind of encryption there are two keys there are two keys and each the sender as well as receiver both have a set of two keys one key is the private key a public key and also the sender also uh, the sender also has a private key and public key and the receiver also has a private key and a public key so in the communications which are end to end encrypted this means that these conversations are encrypted at both ends that is at the end of the sender and also at the end of the receiver so there are several platforms which we can see right now say whatsapp this it says that the conversations are end to end encrypted that is when you install this installation this uh, this application whatsapp in this two keys are generated with us say the sender she installed this application and two keys are generated for her one is her public key and everyone can know this public key her public key and there is a private key which is only known to that particular person and now say the same uh, applies for bob also and now say she wants to send a message to bob then using the public key of bob using the public key the message can be encrypted 
and this all happens via algorithms and now when there is a need to decrypt the masses only bob can decrypt the masses because only he has his private key so the private key which bob has because only he has is so he can decrypt this masses hence this asymmetric encryption is more secure as compared to this symmetric encryption right i hope you understood it so generally the end to end encryption software they use asymmetric encryption primarily they use asymmetric encryption and they can also used hybrid encryption which is the mix of both symmetric encryption as well as asymmetric encryption now based on this information let us solve this practice question and now this topic is important for us in the field of science and technology it and computers as in the year 2022 we found this particular question which was regarding software as a service now let's solve this question which says that consider the following statement with reference to end to end encryption first statement the end to end encryption primarily works using symmetric encryption now this is an incorrect statement as end to end encryption works primarily it works using asymmetric encryption it can also use hybrid encryption the second statement is the contents of encrypted messages using end to end encryption can be accessed by the sender receiver and the messaging service provider in general see this is an incorrect statement why so in general conditions these platforms which offer these services say that the encrypted messages can only be accessed by the sender and receiver and even the messaging service provider is not able to access the contents of encrypted messages in general conditions but there may also be some conditions say in the case of national security in in that field the national security agencies of the country can request this messaging service providers to provide a uh, provide a uh, say backdoor entry to see this encrypted messages in that case the messaging service provider can decrypt that messages for say national service agencies but in general cases the contents of encrypted messages are only be can only be accessed by the sender and receiver so this becomes incorrect now as the question asks which of the statement given above is or are incorrect as correct our answer would be statement option d neither one nor two now let's move on to our final mcq for the day this is inspired by this news article which appeared on page number 13 of the hindu now recently rbi uh, has re uh, has released some guidelines on state guarantees regarding the guarantees which are issued by state governments now let's understand this that what is happening here now see one thing state governments say any state government take any particular state uh, say for example up uttar pradesh uttar pradesh the the state government can take any loan from any sources external sources and this is the case of direct borrowing by any particular state and such kind of direct borrowing which uttar pradesh takes from external sources loans right from any sources this kind of direct borrowing is reflected in the fiscal deficit of uttar pradesh right of this government in the budget documents which the state government presents in the fiscal deficit of it such kind of borrowing is reflected now say there is other kind of borrowing which the government takes that is off budget borrowing now what is off budget borrowing as the name itself implies it is an off budget that is such kind of borrowing are not mentioned in the budget documents of government so what is this route in this route the state government is not directly taking loans but it may take loans via help of some public sector undertaking say there is a psu and government is not directly taking loan and giving it to psu rather government ask the psus to there is a bank government ask the psu to take loan from this bank right and in turn this psu may give this amount may give either the psu may utilize this amount or the psu may give this amount to the state government so this is what happens is off budget borrowing 
but such kind of borrowing is not mentioned in the is not included in the fiscal deficit of the government right or in the budget documents of the government so what is fiscal deficit fiscal deficit is the difference between total expenditure of the government minus the total revenue of the government see any state government can get revenue in the form of taxes and non tax sources right and government has to do some expenditure right say the expenditure of the government is say 120 crore in a financial year in one financial year government spends 120 crore rupees and the total revenue of the government was say for example 100 crores and this total revenue will not include borrowings that is the borrowing of the government is not included in this total revenue then government expends 120 rupees government is uh, spending it but government just has 100 crore rupees right so what is the deficit here the deficit is of 20 crores so this 20 crores is the fiscal deficit this is the fiscal deficit of the government that is the deficit or the difference in total expenditure minus total revenue except the borrowing it does not includes the borrowing of the government right and now let's understand that what are the concerns now in this news article there are some concerns that these these state guarantees the state government guarantees to the psus are increasing in the country in this case we saw that in the case of off budget borrowing state government is asking psus to take loans and for this say if this bank does not want to give loan to this psu government will give a guarantee government will give a guarantee to the bank state government will give a guarantee to the bank that see in case this psu is not able to pay back your loan we will give you we will pay back you loan so it is a kind of guarantee contingent guarantee that is this guarantee is subject to fulfillment by the state government that if this psu will not return you loan we will return you right so this is a this is the meaning this is the meaning of state government guarantee but now increasingly there is a concern that these state government guarantees are increasing or the off budget borrowing of the state governments are increasing now what are the concerns with it the concerns is that say these public sector banks or say this psus if they take loans from the banks in case these psus they fail right because of mismanagement or because of any other issue then ultimately these loans which the psus have taken government has to fulfill these loans right and when government has to fulfill these loans what will happen ultimately this will lead to this will lead to accumulation of the loan and in and it may happen that even the government is not able to pay this loan right so there is will be a negative impact on the fiscal position of state government because of this irrational issuance of state government guarantees first thing is that this will impact the negative this will impact the financial health of any state government this accumulation of these guarantees or loan the second thing is it will present a moral hazards if these psus if they are taking loans from say banks and government is giving guarantee to them so there would be a kind of uh, these these psus because they direct because they know that in case they fail there is government who is backing them in that case they won't take due diligence right in that case there will be a moral hazard in this case that these psus they are mismanaging and uh, they are not taking due diligence right so these are some issues which may arise when there is an irrational issuance of state government guarantees right now so to prevent it state government has given some to prevent it state government has given some guidelines on the issuance of state guarantees now what are these guidelines these guidelines says that there should be a purpose for giving government guarantees that is the purpose for 
for uh, the very purpose for which the state government is giving these guarantees should be defined whether this is for any constructive purpose or whether it is for rerouting the loan from tsus to the state government right the purpose should be ethical second thing is there should be a risk categorization that is the project for which the government is giving guarantee for the loans for the project these projects should be classified based on their risk profile that whether they are high risk medium risk or low risk third thing is there should be a ceiling that presently there is no ceiling there is no cap on the state on the guarantees which are given by state government so there should be a reasonable ceiling for the incremental guarantees to avoid any financial stress on the state government finally the disclosure standards that is see government should keep a proper account of these off budget borrowings and government should disclose that how much uh, government should disclose the state the guarantees which it has issued to this psus right so there should be a data which should disclose these all uh, parameters or these all uh, we should disclose the numbers of these uh, state government guarantees right so these are the guidelines which are given by rbi now based on this information let us solve this practice question and which is regarding the budgeting section because budgeting section is important in uh, for the for our examination uh, the budget of india as well as the budget of state governments especially the procedure in the budget that what is the procedure for example in the year 2016 we found this particular question and which was regarding persistent deficit budget right and now this uh, practice question says that which of the following best defines the term fiscal deficit and these are the statements you can read here over the screen now we already discussed that what is fiscal deficit fiscal deficit is the difference between government's total expenditure and its total receipts but excluding borrowings that is borrowing of the government is not counted in the total receipt of the government so this is the this is fiscal deficit i hope this topic is clear now with this let's move on to our mains topics so the first topic for today's mains discussion is inspired by this news article which appeared on the hindu business line now this article is regarding narcl national asset reconstruction company limited and this article says it expresses concern regarding the long term viability of narcl but for understanding this article let us first understand that what is narcl what is the rationale for its construction what is it all about right what is the benefit of it and what are the challenges which this entity is facing and now this is important for us this very topic is important for us in gs paper 3 economy under the syllabus head indian economy and issues relating to planning mobilization of resources growth development and employment basically in the category mobilization of resources now let's proceed further and let's understand that what is narcl you have heard about this term bad bank bad bank uh, it was an entity bad bank is an entity which was announced in the budget of 2021 but it was formally constituted by government of india in july 2021 so if we talk about bad bank it comprises of two entities one is narcl <clears throat> other is idrcl right so these are two entities which together comprises of bad bank now what is the function of bad bank the function of bad bank is to accumulate to uh, recover say and manage nps the function of bad bank is to recover and manage non performing assets now what are non performing assets non performing assets is any loan which is overdue with banks any loan which is overdue for a period of more than 90 days so such kind of loans which is overdue which is not being paid for the period of 9 days 90 days sorry this is known as a non performing asset for that bank right 
now we know that that in the indian in the public sector banks of india especially uh, since last 7 or 8 uh, years there has been a huge problem of accumulation of non performing assets with these banks that is there is an enormous amount of bad loans bad loans these non performing assets bad loans which are uh, which are categorized in various categories but some of the bad loans are in the condition that these kinds of loan can never be recovered now right so because of this huge accumulation of npas with the banks the banks was facing a problem of lack of liquidity these banks were not having enough capital and so they were not able to do their primary activity which is giving credit right so in order to resolve this bad loan crisis from the banking sector primarily there was a constitution of bad bank and important fact about bad bank is that this bad banks is owned by public sector banks themselves they hold a 51% stake in this bad banks that is these banks have created a bad bank which will comprise of nrcl and irdcl and the primary purpose of national asset reconstruction company limited is to recover any npa now suppose there is a bank right and this is nar cl now what will nar cl do nar cl will say this bank that you have npa sell this M npa to us and this bank will sell their npas to nar cl and there will be an assigned or an agreed value in which the nar cl will say okay this is the value we will give you for this npa right but this value which nar cl gives to the bank this is not entirely in cash nar cl gives banks amount which is 15% in cash and 85% in terms of security receipts so for this transaction 15% is given in cash and 85% is given in security receipts what are security receipts security receipt is a kind of financial instrument like bonds these are kinds of financial instruments which can be further resold in a secondary market that is these bank can sell these security receipts in secondary markets and when there are some investors who are who wants to buy these security receipts these bank can gain their money their amount right and what is the role of irdcl the role of irdcl is to liquidate is to sell these npas that is npas narcl will recover these npas and irdcl will settle or it will sell these npas and together narcl plus irdcl is known as bad bank right so this is what is happening this is the basic uh, basic uh, basic concept of bad bank and now see there are significant advantages there are some advantages that why these of these bad banks or if we talk about narcl in particular there are significant advantages let's see that what are the advantages <laughs> first thing is that it will clear the balance sheet of the banks as we all know that if banks have heavy npas then bank do not have enough capital and this capital is locked with the banks let's see see when there is a loan say a bank is giving 100 crores of loan to any person and say if this loan becomes npas so when a bank gives a certain amount of loan to anyone this bank has to keep certain percentage of this amount of this loaned amount with it say for example we we may consider say bank has to keep 5% of 100 crore as a provisioning amount so then bank has to keep aside 5 crores of rupees with it now for every loan which is given by the bank bank has to keep some amount as a provisioning ratio right but when these banks sell these npas to narcl 
in that condition bank is selling these non performing assets to narcl in that condition the amount which was logged as lower provisioning ratio sorry this amount which was logged as provisioning ratio in the banks this amount will be released right so this will infuse liquidity in the banks so the first advantage is that when the balance sheet of banks is cleared when the npas are sold to narcl this will unlock or this will lower this provisioning ratio with the banks so this will release this amount and this capital will be unlocked and which will be used for credit creation and also by another sense we see that this bank get by the sale of npas bank get 15% in cash and also bank can generate amount with by selling security receipts in that case also bank can generate capital right and this this credit can be this can be given to people uh to uh, this this credit which has been accumulated can be given as loans right second advantage is that optimal recovery rate now in the absence of narcl there were uh, some private arcs that is asset reconstruction companies and see if banks need money so banks can do one thing that it can speedily it can hastily dispose of its npas and in certain cases banks had to sell their npas to the private asset reconstruction companies in uh, in haste or in distress sale or we can say in distress sale now for it the recovery which the bank was getting or the amount which the bank was getting was very low so by the construction of this by the establishment of narcl <clears throat> this can avoid this distress sale and banks will be able to get an optimal recovery rate right thirdly this i missed one statement i'll tell you now see in case uh <clears throat> now see what happens in the what happened in the creation uh, in the creation of narcl bank said if uh, government said government of india said if this bank they are not able to realize their security receipts in case they are not able to sell the security receipt then in that case we are making a fund and government made a fund of 30600 crore and government in one sense government gave a sovereign guarantee that in case you the bank which is selling its npa is not able to uh, to recover amount by selling security receipt in uh, say security receipt is uh, not being sold in the market in that case there will be a guarantee there is a sovereign guarantee that okay we can from this amount from this fund you can recover these banks can recover their uh, their uh, bank can recover the amount right by using this 30600 crore corpus which was given by the government right and now because of this sovereign guarantee which has been given by the government of india this option of buying security receipt or say the investors who want to buy this security receipts because it is backed by government guarantee then it becomes attractive for them to purchase security receipts which are a uh, which are a type of financial instruments or bond which these investors can invest in right the third thing is the fourth thing is that this will lead to faster aggregation of distressed assets or at least we can say that narcl was formed with the purpose to fast for faster aggregation of distressed assets now let's see an example say there is a person a who has taken loans from multiple banks say bank 1 bank 2 bank 3 now if now if all these loans became npa in these following banks in this case of recovery earlier what happened was that 
all these three banks they used to form a committee of creditors for recovery of this loan amount right but see because there are various stakeholders involved in this process of diluting npas or for settling the amount so there can be some disagreement because of lack of coordination so the purpose of narcl was to form a body which will oversee which will aggregate this body narcl will aggregate this amount the stressed amount from these banks itself right and this will lead to faster aggregation of these distressed assets is it clear and finally with all these uh, with with this all this mechanism this will lead this will speed up the process of say recovery of stressed assets also of sale of these stressed assets right so these are the advantages of bad bank but see in the article itself we saw that there are certain challenges or there are certain issues with nar cl which was formed in the year 2021 and now two years has passed more than two years have been passed of its formation what is the first issue the first issue is itself in the idea of bad bank see the formation of bad bank was to buy the stressed assets or buy the npas from the banks right so these this narcl is buying the stressed assets from bank but in one sense this is the transfer of loans or transfer of npas stressed assets from one entity which is bank to narcl so is it is it solving any issue it is just transferring these bad loans from one entity to any other entity so the very purpose is that the core issue what is the core issue that why are these uh, bad debts why is this npa created the core issue is mismanagement in this public sector banks or mismanagement in the in the say companies who are taking loans and there are various cases for example mismanagement of public sector banks in the psus who are taking loans or in any other private companies the second thing is that there may be a willful there are various willful debtors the debtors who have taken loan despite having money they don't give uh, the loans they don't pay back the loans those are loans willful defaulters right so there are various issues because of which these stressed assets are being created at the first place but we know that this is not this doesn't seem like a viable solution because this is not addressing the core issue right the other thing is moral hazard moral hazard is that as we know that banks they know that if they have nps there is narcl which will buy these nbas with these banks so banks will not uh, banks will not uh, adopt due diligence in granting loans to say psus to other companies or any other individuals so bank will not in one sense we can say bank can be careless in the dispersal of loans because it knows that there is an nrcl which can buy these assets so this is create a condition of moral hazard third thing is that there is an issue with the valuation of these non performing assets see there is a dilemma in how these the price of this npa would be set now say a bank has a property bank has a industry say bank has a npa and for which there is a collateral which is of an industry bank says okay now we don't get money from this uh, this debtor and then in that condition we will sell his company we will sell the company of the person who took loan from us but what is the mechanism for which the fair value of this assets which the bank hold or this uh, say in this case this company which the banks has presently how is the fair value of this company determined this is the main issue because if 
the valuation of this NPA is too high, then NARCL is at loss. But if the valuation of these uh, NPAs is too low, then the banks who have given loans, they are at loss. So there is a dilemma over NPA pricing. And generally it has been seen that NARCL is more interested in buying NPH which has become vintage. Vintage means these are the assets which are long pending with the banks say for more than 4 years. And you know that as the time passes, passes by the value of this company or these assets, they will deteriorate further. So NARCL will have more profit when it buys the vintage NPAs from banks. But this would be less profitable for these banks because banks will get only less value for these NPAs or for these assets which the bank holds. Also, there is a issue that when NARCL is buying these NPAs, there is a huge haircut. What is a haircut? Haircut is that, say, the asset, the original value of the loan, so the loan was worth 100 crores, but now after the NP, after it is been settled by NARCL, the banks are only banks are getting a haircut of 85 to 90 percent. If we see 90 percent haircut, then we will see that banks are only getting banks will only get 10 crore rupees. So this is an enormous haircut, and because of which banks are facing losses. Other thing is that there is delays in recovery in spite for the very rationale of NARCL was to speed up this process. But we have seen that there is delays in recovery. As the example in the article says that recently NARCL it made offers in last financial year it made offers for uh, bidding uh, for, uh, for onboarding or for buying uh, NPAs from 30 different accounts and just understand that the uh, the offer was made for uh, more uh, for around rupees one uh, rupees one one lakh seventy thousand crores, okay. But the actual the actual NPAs which were uh, recovered the actual NPAs which were say recovered by NARCL they were only around rupees twenty three thousand crores. So just a fraction of these NPA or these stressed assets has been onboarded or has been bought up by NARCL and the vast, the large amount of NPAs are still existing with the banks, right? <clears throat> so this is one issue and there is a delays in recovery also due to there is a shortage of experienced manpower in NARCL. Finally, there is an absence of vibrant secondary market. Now we all know that 85% of this NPA amount, this uh, fixed amount issued price was to be given in the form of security receipt and this security receipt could be sold in secondary markets but there is an absence of viable secondary market in India that is the investors, they are not interested in buying this security receipt but if investors are not interested in buying security receipt how is bank going to in cash this 85% of this value which it got from NARCL? So this is an issue, right? So what is the way forward in this regard? First thing is that increasing the liquidity of security receipt. Presently, the security receipt can be bought up by NBFCs, non-banking financial corporation, alternate investment funds, asset reconstruction companies, foreign portfolio investors. But now this this investment option should be expanded to high net worth individuals, people who have high paying capacity or they may be potential investors and to corporate bodies, trust and pension funds, right? This is to infuse liquidity, to increase the sale of security receipts. The other thing is the capitalization of NARCL. NARCL has been formed by banks and so they should, they should aggregate enough capital that it is able to buy NPAs, right? Third thing is there should be time bound resolution of non-performing assets. As we also that saw that there is a delay in the recovery process. This should be resolved in time bound manner. Otherwise, it is only going to depreciate the values of NPAs even further. Fourth thing is 
there should be a mechanism in place which would give a realistic valuation of the non performing assets such that the banks have not to lose much because of large haircuts fifth thing is there should be there should be bought professional expertise in narcl right and other thing is there should be finally which is the core issue there should be reforms in public sector banks in the way they offer loans to the people uh, to the to the debtors to the uh, right to the corporate bodies or to the debtors so there should be finally there should be reforms in public sector banks in order to address this issue at the core right so this is what our first topic was all about the second topic for today's main discussion is inspired by this news article which appeared on the page number 12 of the hindu now the chief justice of india justice d y chandrachud has said that the independence of judiciary is important for the country and he said that he says that an independent judiciary does not merely mean the insulation of institution from the executive and legislative branches we will discuss this that there is a separation of power in india he says that independence does not only mean that judiciary is insulated from legislative and executive rather it also means that the individual judges they are able to perform devoid of any political pressure or devoid of any external external pressure on them so this article is important for us uh, for our gs paper 2 polity and governance and uh, under this labels had separation of powers between various organs dispute uh, dispute redressal mechanism and institutions so let's start this topic now see the state if we talk about india the state has three important organs legislative executive and judiciary we all know this what is the work of legislative the work of legislative is to frame laws right what is the work of executive the function of executive the primary function of executive is to execute or to implement these laws right so what is the work of judiciary judiciary is to review is to see if these laws are being implemented properly right and the in total the combined function of these three organs of any state is to ensure that the democracy of the country it functions efficiently and to provide welfare to the people political welfare social welfare legal welfare and any other welfare economic welfare so this is the purpose by implementation by making the laws which are in spirit of the constitution right this is the and such that these bodies they work in coordination with each other right but despite this there is a in spite of this there is also a fundamental say there is a fundamental principle which is adopted by india which is separation of power now what is separation of power the separation of power says that see all these state organs of state legislative executive and judiciary they have their independent set of functions which are distinct from each other body right so they have independent functions so why do we need separation of powers the first thing is that it would prevent concentration of power with any single entity such that power is not concentrated in any one of these authorities right of these bodies the second thing is that it will prevent encroachment of power say one body one one body would not will not encroach upon the powers of any other bodies for its functioning right so because of this see the beauty of this separation of powers that it provides efficient checks and balances to these bodies in balancing the powers and in order that there is an efficient functioning of the democracy in the country so in today's discussion we will focus on judiciary right judiciary in india we are giving uh, due stress we are giving too much stress on that why judiciary should be independent why should a judiciary be independent the first thing is as we all know that the work of judiciary is to review the laws review the legislations which the government is or which the legislation is for uh, is framing why so this is because in order to ensure that the fundamental rights of the citizen of the country are protected 
they are upheld in order that the principles of the constitution the guiding principles of the constitutions they are upheld in order that the fundamental rights of people of india are upheld in order that the human rights are upheld in the country for it the judiciary has power of judicial review it can do the review of these laws and judiciary under this power can strike out the laws which are not in consonance with the constitution or which are violating the constitution right and these laws or if their implementation if these laws if the implementation of these laws is not in consonance with the constitution then judiciary can do there there can be this is the mechanism for judicial outreach right that's why because and one more thing in order to ensure rule of law in the country and you know rule of law it is a it is a say we can say a beautiful concept or a powerful concept which has been primarily which has been defined way earlier but we will see that according to av dicey what is rule of law the first tenet of rule of law is supremacy of law that only the land of the law is supreme right the second tenet is that there will be equality before law the third thing is that third and more important thing is predominance of legal spirit av dicey recognized gave do emphasis on this concept of predominance of legal spirit av dicey says that only when the enforcer of this laws that is the courts only when they are impartial only when there are they are free from external influence right only when they are free from external influence only when they are impartial then only they will be able to upheld the fundamental rights and also to uphold the rule of law in the country that's why the independence of judiciary is important now let's see that what are the provisions in the country which ensures judicial independence the first provision is security of tenure of judges in india we see that the tenure of a supreme court judge is up to 65 years of age and a high court judge can a high court judge is that of 62 years and their their tenure is fixed that is they can only be removed by impeachment and this is a complicated process for which the resolution of impeachment in case of any say misbehavior or in case of any incapacity of this judges a resolution has to be passed by both houses of parliament and that two with a special majority that is two third of the members of parliament present and voting so it is a complicated process only after this impeachment process these judges can be removed now this safety provision this ensures that these judges they work independently right other thing is the salaries of the judges the salaries of judges are charged upon the consolidated fund of india that is they are not subjected to the vote by legislature right and it cannot be it cannot be decreased to their disadvantages only in one condition of say financial emergency and that is very rare occurrence otherwise the salaries are uh, this is an important provision and which also uh, which also empowers them and it ensures their independence other thing is the power to punish for contempt so for this there are two articles article 129 of indian constitution and article 215 of indian constitution this talks about that supreme court of india has power to punish for its contempt and under this article 215 of indian constitution high court of india has power to punish for its contempt right so this powers they also ensure the independence of these judge of of these judiciary say third thing is uh, finally the activities of judges 
इट कैन नॉट बी डिस्कस्ड बाय एग्जीक्यूटिव और लेजिस्लेचर इट कैन नॉट बी डिस्कस्ड बाय देम फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन पार्लियामेंट यू नो इन पार्लियामेंट देर कैन बी सम काइंड ऑफ रेस्ट्रिक्शंस ऑन द फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच फ्रीडम ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ दीज लेजिस्लेटर्स दैट दे कैन नॉट डिस्कस द एक्टिविटीज ऑफ जजेस ओपनली इन द पार्लियामेंट फॉर विच दे आर नॉट इम्प्यून अदरवाइज लेजिस्लेचर्स आर इम्प्यून फॉर वर्ड दे से और और फॉर दे कंडक्ट इन द पार्लियामेंट बट इन दैट केस दे आर नॉट इम्प्यून दे हैव सम रेस्ट्रिक्शंस ओनली इन द केसेज ऑफ इम्पीचमेंट ओनली ओनली देन दे आर अलाउड टू डिस्कस हवे वर देर आर सम इश्यूज रिगार्डिंग जुडिशियल इंडिपेंडेंस लेट एस सी दिस वट इज द फर्स्ट इशू द फर्स्ट इन प्राइमरी इशूज रिगार्डिंग द अपॉइंटमेंट प्रोसेस ऑफ जजेस नाउ वी ऑल नो दैट प्रेजेंटली by the three judges cases the appointment of judges in india is via the collegium what is collegium system collegium system collegium is a group of some judges group of some senior judges which they hire uh, they hire other judges in upper judiciary for example in the case of supreme court if we say there is a collegium system of four, uh, of uh, there is a collegium system in which there is a chief justice of india plus there are four senior most judges of supreme court and together this collegium they will uh, recommend they will recommend the names of the candidates that these are the names of these particular candidates and they will give this recommendation for the name of the candidates which have which should be appointed in this higher judiciary right in supreme court similarly there is a collegium in high court also right but now see what is the issue here there is a issue that there is no set criteria based on which the name of any individual can be recommended so sometimes there is an issue that there can be an arbitrary or under some influence these judges they may recommend the name of any such can, uh, candidates right so this is the criticism regarding the opacity of this collegium system other thing is succession by seniority in supreme court we have seen that uh, in higher judiciaries high court supreme court we have seen that there is a succession by seniority that is for example in say in the process of election of chief justice of india the next chief justice the name will be recommended by chief, by the present sitting chief justice of india and presently the next cgi will be would be the second or the senior most judge supreme court judge who is next to this cgi right so because of this issue and this is a issue which impacts their impartiality and because there are some allegations that there is an allegations of political interference in this process firstly this process of succession by seniority is not efficient secondly there are allegations that the cgi or this appointment process they may happen due to political interference and because of which this may impact this may impact the integrity of judiciary right second thing is retirement age now we know that a uh, retirement age in supreme court is 65 but retirement age in high court is 62 now just understand if this high court judge if he wants to come uh, join supreme court of india then this judge otherwise in the age of 62 this high court uh, judge is retired but in case he can extend his tenure by being by entering supreme court right so he would so there there can be uh, some issues that he may be tempted he may be tempted that uh, under some political influence or under some external influence he may give certain kind of rulings right and which may impact the integrity of judiciary in order to seek this promotion right third thing is regarding the post retirement appointments see ideally there should be some cool off period after which any say chief justice of india or any other higher senior judge if he is being retired from supreme court or high court there should be a cool off period after only he should enter say politics or any other commissions but this is not the case in india and for example we can see some certain judges some certain senior most judges even of the order of cji they they entered into certain political parties right after they retired from supreme court right so this may also indicate that there can be certain kind of political influence and which may hamper or which may even question the integrity of judiciary fourth thing is regarding the cgi as master of roster now what does this means that 
द चीफ जस्टिस ऑफ इंडिया इट हैज ही हैज द पावर टू डिसाइड द द बेंचेज द जुडिशियल बेंचेज टू विच सर्टेन केसेज विल गो दैट इज देयर सर्टेन केसेज एंड सी जे आई हैज द पावर टू असाइन जुडिशियल बेंचेज टू दोज पर्टिकुलर केसेज नाउ 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 अंडरस्टैंड इफ दिस सी जे आई इफ ही इज इन्फ्लुएंस्ड दैन देर कैन बी इश्यू दैट दिस सी जे आई मे ट्रांसफर केसेज टू सर्टेन काइंड ऑफ बेंचेज विद सर्टेन काइंड ऑफ आइडियोलॉजी राइट फिफ्थ थिंग इज देर आर इश्यूज ऑफ जुडिशियल डिलेज एंड विच वी ऑलरेडी नो दैट देर आर सर्टेन देर आर पेंडिंग केसेज विद जुडिशरी विथ सिंस मैनी ईयर्स राइट सो दिस इज वन इश्यू विच क्वेश्चन द इंटीग्रिटी of the of the of the judiciary also there is a code of conduct which has been formulated by the judiciary but there is an issue regarding its implementation further there is a code of ethics which should be formulated for the judges which is not presently there right and in the absence of this code of ethics for judges and in the poor implementation of this code of conduct for judges this questions their integrity and finally because of which there is a public perception that see judiciary is compromised and judiciary may be compromised in some cases but in other cases say judiciary is not compromised but these all issues build up public perception and because of which because of this public perception say judiciary says that uh, okay let's dispose of cases fastly and uh, there there are certain kind of external pressure peer pressure we can say certain kind of pressure from government uh, from public also so this is how perceptions are created and for which there should be there is a serious issue uh, there is a serious need for reforms in all these in all these areas such that the independence of judiciary is maintained plus the integrity or the public confidence of the confidence of the public in judiciary remains intact right and for our final section for the summary section we have taken two articles first of which is regarding which was present in the science and tech section uh, of the hindu now this article talks about basically genomic revolution promises to transfer cancer care now this is in the context that there is a widespread increase in the cancer cases now we all know that what is cancer cancer is a disease uh, well when there are certain cells which multiply or which divide uncontrollably right there are certain cells which keep on accumulating or keep on growing right and they result in formation of tumors and because of which what happens after some times they these cells they don't die right they become immortal in one sense we can say because of which they produce toxins and these toxins are poisonous for the body and uh, the body's natural defense system body has defense system comprises of t cells and other cells they are not able to detect these cancer cells or uh, they are not able to fight with these cancer cells and because of which the there is an onset of cancer right now if this cancer this can be genetic this mutation basically this mu there is a mutation in the cells right because of which they multiply rapidly and this mutation can either be say hereditary or this can even be acquired also there are two cases but in the case of when we see that there are certain type of cancers for example there is breast cancer there is cancer in ovaries right so there are certain kind of cancers breast cancer ovarian cancer these kind of cancers these are passed on hereditary if a mother has this cancer there are high chances that her daughter will have will also have this this type of cancers right so there is, there must be a relation with the certain kinds of genes which are present in the body of these individuals right so this article talks about this this particular genomic revolution that is by genome sequencing what is genome sequencing genome sequencing is mapping out mapping out the complete set of dna in any individual now we know that we have a human being have 23 pairs of chromosomes right and if these all chromosomes these all chromosomes are made of threads of dna is right and if these dna is and what is dna dna is this double helical structure and if these are the bases and if we get the information regarding what are the sequence of these base pairs then this is known as genomic mapping of complete set of dna 
in case this set of uh, this dna this sequence of base pairs has been decoded for all 23 pairs of chromosomes so we can say this is known as genome mapping or genome sequencing now what is the purpose of genome sequencing it is to identify any particular gene which gene is causing that is we can identify any particular gene which is causing a mutation in which a mutation in which is causing cancer right so on the uh, and by uh, by this information by this genome mapping information there can be certain therapies these therapies are known as precision oncology therapies right so there are certain types of which which were not mentioned in the article but let me tell you first is targeted therapy in this kind of therapy say there are certain genes which are causing or certain molecules which are causing cancer and uh, in this targeted therapy we will use certain drugs that will target certain molecules that are involved in the growth and survival of cancer cells that is there are certain cells <clears throat> we can say there are certain genes or certain pathways that are causing to the development of cancer and because of these drugs it will block the pathways block the pathways block the actions or we can say it will block the actions of these genes so finally targeted therapy is the use of drugs on certain genes which are causing uh, cancer in order to block their actions right such that the growth of cancer cells or their survival is impacted now one example is by using uh, monoclonal antibodies this we will discuss next time if we get chance in future and then let's talk about immunotherapy right and what is immunotherapy this is a kind of uh, this is a kind of therapy in which the body's own immune system is uh, is utilized for uh, attacking cancer cells and there is a therapy if you have heard about CAR T cell therapy so in this kind of therapy there is a T cell in the body of the patient who is suffering from cancer the T cell from the body of that person is taken out and this T cell is genetically modified and after genetical modification of these T cells certain kind of receptors they are visible on the surface of these T cells and then this genetically modified T cells is inserted again in the body of that patient and then what happens this modified T cells it will identify the cancer cell or it will attach in one sense it will attach with the cancer cell with the help of these receptors and this will able to uh, kill that cancer cell but because we are directly activating the immunity of in person because we are using T cells and these are the important component of immune system of immune system of the body so that's why this is known as immunotherapy right and there is other kind of therapy which is gene therapy and in this what happens that body in this therapy we will recognize we will find out particular genes which are uh, which are causing cancer and then these genes can be say replaced we can replace these genes that is using genetic modification genetic gene editing technologies we can edit these genes we can remove these genes from the body right or we can by rna uh, by other methods we can silence these genes right so this is in brief the article is all about now our final article for the day is inspired by this news article which appeared on the page number 12 of indian express this article is about subsidies under the present government now this is related to the issue of direct and indirect subsidies right in the agriculture in the this is important for our gs paper three now see in this article a chart is given and if you see this chart you can see that this chart shows the years it starts from financial year 14 2014 and it ends at uh, around financial year 2023 right and we can see as we move from financial year 2014 to the financial year 2024 see from the time period 2014 financial year 2014 to financial year 2019 the subsidies the amount of subsidies which the government gave it declined right we can see in this chart that the subsidies is declining but in the financial year 2019-2020 obviously by the by some factors prominent of which was covid-19 pandemic again we can see a prominent spike in the dispersal of subsidies by the government 
and which is subsequently uh, subsequently declining but still the present level of subsidies which the government is giving at presently in this financial year this is way higher as compared to the first term of the present government in the first term of modi government these subsidies the government was giving decreased but now in the second term this subsidies have increased right and what are the reasons for it the first thing is that in the period between in the first term of modi government that in the period between 2014 to 2019 the author says that despite there were various scheme various welfare schemes which the government launched say so, pradhan mantri aayush yojana swachh bharat mission jal jeevan mission bank account and other gas subsidies also uh, because of this new welfareism schemes in spite of these welfareism scheme the subsidy burden of the government it declined from 2.2% of gdp to in the year 2013 14 2 1% of gdp in the year 2018 2019 the primary reason for which was the easing of international crude prices that is the that is the crude prices in the international market they fell right and because of its fell then government had sufficient benefit right but however the government did not pass on this benefit of this fall in international crude price to the consumers did not pass on fully these benefits other thing was that government applied government kya kehte hai government increased increased the excise duty excise duty on petrol and diesel and because of which there was higher collection of taxes also the fertilizer prices in international market it they declined and because of which government had sufficient government saved sufficient forex amount which the government was spending further in the crude oil and fertilizer prices right and this all led to the balance in subsidies in the recent time uh, in the in in the past tenure of the government but now we can see that in the period between 2019 to 2023 these subsidies they increased from 1% of gdp at this level 2018 2019 to presently 3.6% in 2020 2021 there were two major reasons for it the first thing is in the case of food security that is in first case government paid the entire debt of food corporation of india right and this was what uh, this was what led to the rise in burden of subsidy with the government other case government paid off the burdens of fertilizer subsidy also in this particular in in 2 years ago and also uh, when the covid 19 due to covid 19 pandemic there was higher food grain subsidy which the government had to give right in the pradhan mantri an uh, garib kalyan anna yojana and also uh, because there were massive layoffs in the jobs government had to increase increase the amount of employment in manrega scheme so because of all this there was enormous burden on government uh, regarding food and agriculture and other subsidies because of which the subsidy burden of the government increased further there because of the impact of russia ukraine war the prices of the fertilizer say urea npk and uh, urea npk nitrogen phosphates these fertilizers these increased and because of which again this compounded this added to the subsidy burden of the government right so this is the article this is what the article is all about so that's all for today and uh, if you have any queries you can ask us in the comment section thank you